Okay, Hedy says we're ready. I'm ready. So let's go. Um, so uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I've spent the last few months uh, putting together a, a proposal for NSF with um, members of the science circle and some of my uh, colleagues. So I really um, put the bulk of this pro uh, talk together in about the last week and a half. So maybe a little more rough than some of the ones that I've given in the past. So um, with that, let's take it away. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about some recent advances in perovskite solar cells. If you don't know what perovskites are, uh, no problem. That's part of the talk. Um, let's see. So oh yeah, going back here, you're going to see you're going to see lots of my cats. Oh, there's a little bit of a lag in there. Okay, that's uh, that's Ishtar, and of course, as a cat, she is a goddess. Uh, so how does solar power work? Ideally, what we have is some sort of panel which harvests the free energy that just comes from the sky um, and uh, then channels it into cell phones so we sh can see pictures of cats. That's the ideal um, of how solar power uh, should work. Uh, today you'll note that my uh, talk is an odd juxtaposition of hand-drawn and computer-generated images. Um, I, I really like the old school stuff, but the new school stuff also works really well for me. So first, let's talk about how electrons interact with nuclei. It's always all about how positive and ch negative charges um, uh, attract each other and what rules and boundaries there are on those attractions. So um, with this uh, scary little diagram, I'm, I'm showing you a um, potential energy well. You've seen these sorts of pictures before. When you think about um, gravitational wells and black holes and things, but here I'm talking about the electromagnetic force. So right at the bottom of the well, we can have a nucleus, a positive charge. And an electron, being a quantum thing, um, has to have some space in which to exist. Um, and uh, it will have some energy. Um, and essentially what will happen um, once all the boundary conditions are satisfied is that um, it will sit at uh, specific energy levels in this well. So this bottom level here um, with the longest wavelength, think of a string vibrating. The math is pretty much the same as um, governing a string vibrating as governing the probability of where you're going to find the electron. Um, you can have a um, electron down here at, uh, let's call it the lowest energy, primary harmonic, and then the second harmonic would be where it's got um, roughly twice as much energy, but the boundary conditions are a little bit different because the shape of, this is the shape of the well. Okay? And these give us three-dimensional regions where an electron could be the lowest energy one, might look like a sphere. Uh, next higher up uh, might look like a sphere that's been divided in two or a dumbbell type shape. All right, so um, yeah, it does look like a, it does look like a face. Um, and, um, you know, I was, yeah, that's my drawing. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, how about this? this? This looks a little bit better. And um, I've actually um, recorded a little uh, video. Let's put it up here. It's You're going to have to watch it on your own. Uh, let's see. Nope. There we go. Edit. I'm going to have to unlink those. Unlink. There we go. Okay. Okay. Click. getting the bad sound. Do you really want to unlink? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Alrighty. There we go. Okay, I was having trouble selecting. So, There we go. So, so with with that one, that panel, that'll give you a link to a video I recorded. So it actually has an animation, and and for, forgive me for having my uh, scary face in the corner of there. 
I'll just uh, uh, pop that up there. Okay, so don't expect that one to actually animate in Second Life. I, we didn't uh, set it up to do that. But here's, um, here's a mock-up of, or a metaphor for the photoelectric effect. Let's say that this uh, yellow brick object here is a photon, and it's going to hit an electron that's sitting in a potential energy well at a particular um, surface. Um, no, I don't really want you to watch it right now. It can be something you can do later. Because um, I've got a bunch of slides that just animate this uh, quickly for us. So let's have that electron be hit by that photon. There's some energy transfer, and the electron gets kicked out of that well. In the video, I try a couple of times, and I don't have enough energy the first two times, and the um, electron goes back and stays in the well. Okay, of course, uh, interesting things like balls moving around in uh, little holes uh, interest my cats as well. But what can happen is that the electron, if it has sufficient energy, goes away. So that would be a metaphor for the photoelectric effect, where a photon hits a metal and kicks an electron out completely. And it's an actual sharp transition between not having enough energy and having enough energy. Um, if there's not enough energy, the electron goes back in its hole. Um, Photoelectrons can be ejected by metals. Uh, Einstein's Nobel Prize was uh, for uh, explaining this effect. And there's a wonderful technique called photoelectron spectroscopy where we can compare the energy of the electrons that were ejected with the original energy of the photons used. And we can find the depth of the well, i.e. how far down in a well the potential energy well the um, electrons came from. And so we can actually probe the um, um, molecular orbital structure um, of a molecule through photoelectron spectroscopy. It's a wonderful technique. But what happens when your photons aren't energetic enough to kick an electron right out? Well, the energy will get wasted, um, basically through collisions. It will heat up the metal. The electron goes back into the original situation. And essentially, this is because in metals, there are so many ways for um, the um, electron to transfer energy to other electrons, to the lattice. Uh, and the electrons are so mobile in metals that you know, we don't, can't really get energy easily from just shining light on a metal. So, we use semiconductors. In metals, the electrons move way too easily. Okay, so we need a longer-lived charge separation. And by charge separation, I'm going to um, define that as um, the electron going somewhere and the hole that's left behind. Both of these, electron and the hole, um, allow for conductivity, right? Just like, um, I don't know if you remember those puzzles. They're uh, panels of numbers. They're square. They have one panel missing so that you can move the numbers around and basically get them back in order. Um, if you don't have a panel missing, none of the numbers can move. Right? That is the value of having a hole, because an electron can jump into a hole and then leave another hole behind. Okay? So semiconductors allow the electrons to move around, but slowly enough to allow some control over what they do. And one of the points of this talk is that perovskites as semiconductors are a recent discovery. Uh, 10 years, maybe 15 years. Um, but here's the thing, in the last 10 years of work on them, their efficiency in solar cells is as good as uh, 50 years of development on silicon. And that's actually going to be one of the bottom lines of my talk. So going back to this uh, scary little picture, going back to this scary little picture, let's think of the vibrations on the string. Let's uh, just think of um, the electron as um, just having some sort of uh, phase, as it were. What if you have 
a row of atoms, a row of these wells that are overlapping just a little bit. Okay. Um, well, if there's an electron in each well, then these electrons could each be vibrating in parallel, or they could be vibrating in out of phase. We could set up um, interference patterns, basically, um, of all the possible combinations of their vibrations. Let's see. Is that because of the advantages of perovskites themselves? I actually think it's because of the advantages of the perovskites. Um, we pretty much do know how to make um, solar uh, panels in the last hmm, 30 years or so. Um, and the perovskites aren't manufactured in the same way as the silicon ones are. So uh, talking about uh, strings being in phase or out of phase, just talking about maybe four atoms. You could have the strings all vibrating in the same way. And that might be a low energy uh, combination. Or we could have two vibrating the same way and then two that are out of phase, right? So when these guys are at their maxima on the left, these guys might be at their minima on the right, okay? And essentially, if we have, um, I'm going to call them orbitals now, because that's, that's exactly what they are. If we have four orbitals on four atoms, there's going to be four ways to arrange uh, the phases. It's not really a law of conservation, probably is, but um, whenever you have a, a molecule or a structure of some kind, the number of atomic orbitals that go in, um, is always conserved. You always get the same amount uh, if they of molecular orbitals or structure orbitals out of, at the end. So here's the thing. I basically started with one orbital on one well. But if we have more and more overlapping atoms, then what happens is that the interference patterns that um, are built up end up giving you continuous bands of orbitals, right? So if I have some atom that's got an S, that's a spherical orbital. If I've got the same atom and it's got uh, P orbitals, those are the dumbbell shaped. They tend to be aligned along X, Y, and Z axes. Uh, these, things, these things are essentially going to interfere with themselves. And if I have a billion of these atoms, say, um, we are going to get a lot of um, orbitals that are closely spaced. But there's going to be discrete regions, gaps, where uh, there is no overlap. Okay? So essentially what I've done here is shown you a full band at the bottom here and a empty band up at the top. Oh, thank you. Thank you for the drawings. I, I actually like doing the drawings. Um, my postdoc advisor once told me that, um, you know, reviewers will appreciate a hand-drawn image if it conveys a message and can be done in a minimal amount of time. You know, sometimes you don't need to spend days making the same image by computer. Um, there's going to be some more cats around. Um, so let's, let's think about two different situations. Maybe the upper band and the lower band can overlap, okay? Because maybe that original gap between S and P isn't so big. That's what we have here on the left. Um, I call this a metal because this lower band, and I've just kind of drawn it off set a little bit, overlaps in energy with the upper band. And that means that some of the electrons that are over here in the um, full band can kind of move over to this empty band. And that provides space. Uh, it provides those gaps in the little square puzzles I was talking about. I'm sure they have a name. Um, uh, that it allows the um, electrons to move around freely. Here's the thing. Going back here. Way back here. Okay, this is the slide I need. Um, 
each each atom or each orbital does have a contribution to make. Um, the electron can be anywhere in the structure. It can essentially um, tunnel from any atom to any other atom, even one that might be a millimeter away. Um, while that is unlikely, it does mean that the electrons can move around and are delocalized throughout the whole um, structure as a metal. Okay? And, but that's only if there's some vacant orbitals to move in. Most of the time, or a lot of the time, you have these non-overlapping uh, bands of orbitals, and you've got a gap in between them. And here's the thing. Um, thermal energy can sometimes give the electrons enough oomph to jump into the empty band. And once they're in the empty band, those electrons can move around, and they leave behind holes in the original um, lower band, and they can move around as well. Why don't quantum mechanic effects mess up our control more than they do? Oh, I'm I'm simplifying things so much. Things um, the quantum mechanical stuff, oh, is terrible. I've actually got a little bit from Roald Hoffman, who got a Nobel Prize for doing quantum mechanical stuff, calculations in chemistry. I've got a few slides from him later on. Um, they're just called sliding puzzles. Okay, I'm going to go with sliding puzzles. So band gap. Um, uh, let's see. So for metals, uh, I think a property of a metal is that its conductivity decreases as you increase the temperature, and that's explained by atomic vibrations kind of blocking the electron from being able to get to where they uh, maybe want to go if there's a voltage applied. Uh, semiconductors, on the other hand, the more thermal energy there is, the more promotion of electrons into the upper band there is, and that means that you have uh, more conductivity. So metals and semiconductors can be differentiated from each other by measuring conductivity as a function of temperature. Here's the thing. Um, technically, there's no such thing as an insulator. There's only a semiconductor with a huge band gap. Um, and it may be that you would uh, vaporize a insulator before you get a single electron jumping its band gap. But um, you know, technically, once that electron has um, jumped, then you've got more conductivity. So it's um, um, conduct. So so it would be classed as a semiconductor. That's the, the, it's just a tiny thing. Um, so what I've drawn here are called intrinsic. Um, semiconductors where you can have um, promotion of electrons and they um, um, allow for conductivity. Band gaps much greater than KP. Yes. Yes. Yes, glass, uh, quartz, um, things like that. Very good insulators technically. Um, but, you know, if we're going to be um, correct with the terminology, it's still a semiconductor. So um, the semiconductor we're really um, familiar with is uh, silicon. And believe it or not, silicon has the same structure as diamond. And I think I have a silicon up here somewhere. There we go. So I've drawn two uh, representations of, uh, of uh, silicon. And one of them I've just represented uh, the silicon atoms by. Tetrahedra. So here we have uh, this little chunk of silicon. You could call it a little chunk of a diamond if you want. Uh, let's see if I get out of that. That may just appear in front of you. And um, you know, essentially, essentially that um, shows you how this uh, block of atoms might form. Um, might might form an ordered array uh, a crystal um, that uh, could be used for um, you know making devices. Let me move that one out of the way. I actually like looking at atoms better. All right, 
That one can go away. I have to find the other one now. Oh, up, up we go. Click. And right down there. So believe it or not, this is the same structure from the same data. I think this data comes from 1963 or was collected in 1963. It's actual crystal structure data um, done by uh, X-ray uh, methods. Each of these spheres represents a silicon atom. And you can see that each sphere or some of these spheres look as if they're at the center of a tetrahedron. This is just a chunk of the structure. Each silicon atom is at uh, the center of a tetrahedron of other silicon atoms. I don't really know what happens at the boundaries of the crystal. It's probably got oxygens and hydrogens and things like that. But inside the crystal, every silicon atom has the same environment. Um, and it's exactly the same way of putting together the atoms as it is for diamond. Uh, that always blows my mind. Silicon and diamond have the same structure. Um, but why do you think of silicon as a semiconductor and diamond as an insulator? That's a good question. One cool thing about this structure, since it's the same data as the other structure, is that, um, let's see if I can edit this. I can spend just a tiny bit of time moving these structures. The ball and stick model actually fits inside the other model. It fits inside there perfectly um, if I can get them arranged quickly enough so that it doesn't look like I'm just fiddling around. There it is. Uh, yeah, so inside the um, inside those tetrahedra, um, that those uh, ball and stick models fit fit quite nicely. All righty. Uh, next slide. So let's just talk about um, uh, diamond and silicon. And if we're going to um, reduce down diamond and silicon as far as they can go, uh, you know, having a carbon in a tetrahedral environment that's simple. Think of a uh, carbon sitting inside tetrahedron of um, hydrogen atoms okay, or, or methane. Um, hey, one of the tools that I use to teach this stuff to my uh, classes is this little guy. I'm going to move this thing up front. Because here we are. Because the orbitals are all based on Cartesian coordinates. And tetrahedral is hard to visualize, but the tetrahedron can fit inside a cube quite nicely. Um, if you have a cube and you have two corners on the top and the opposite two corners on the bottom and you join them, you've got a tetrahedron. So um, I use this tool as a way of helping my students visualize what happens when they have um, tetrahedral environments and you know how they can uh, relate that to what X, Y, and Z are actually doing. Let's see, edit. I'm going to move you down. There. Okay, good. Okay, so thinking about tetrahedra, what can they do? Um, thinking about carbon, carbon's got an S, carbon's got its three P's, and a tetrahedral arrangement of hydrogens will end up having an orbital and then three other orbitals uh, that are at the same energy. And it ends up that these three on the hydrogens um, can combine with those three on the carbons and the single ones do the same, and you end up getting a set of low orbitals and a set of high orbitals. And I've just really sketched out how these um, orbitals are. It's not quantitative or anything. Um, carbon is four from the left of the periodic table, which means it's got four electrons available for forming bonds. There are f Hydrogen only has one, but there are four of them, so that's another four electrons. 
And you might see I've drawn one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight little arrows, each representing an electron in the lower uh, set of orbitals. Um, so these um, guys end up being um, from constructive interference. Uh, it's basically where the electrons can sit in between the nuclei and um, have plus minus plus arrangements that uh, contribute to overall attraction. Up here, these are from destructive interference and would, if they were occupied, they would result in destabilization of the uh, tetrahedron. Hey, silicon has the same thing going on. It's qualitatively the, the same, but the original gap is smaller. So the gap between the filled and the empty for the silane, as it's called, is smaller. Hmm. What does that mean? Okay, so um, I've kind of drawn a better picture of, um, less hand-drawn picture, I suppose, of um, where we get some band structure from. Um, if you look at these um, they're called bonding and anti-bonding orbitals, the stuff that's right in the middle of each diagram. I've reproduced it here on the left of uh, each of these diagrams. And as you get more and more and more carbon atoms arranged in uh, tetrahedra, these anti-bonding guys are going to form a band, as we discussed earlier. The bonding ones are going to form a band, as we discussed earlier. The bottom band is completely full, um, uh, packed like herring in a um, can. Uh, there's no room for the slide puzzle thing to happen and for any electrons to move. The band gap is giant, so very few electrons can make their way into this upper um, orbital. So carbon, um, when it's in the diamond structure, you think of it as an insulator. Silicon, on the other hand, has a smaller gap. Uh, you know, since the electrons are further away from the nucleus in silicon to begin with, um, they are uh, less differentiated in energy. Uh, so you get a smaller gap. And this gap is small enough so that some electrons can penetrate their way into the upper set, making silicon an uh, intrinsic semiconductor. It's not very conductive, though, and there's ways that we can improve conductivity. Um, so let's say that we've got silicon here. We've got our uh, filled band. We've got an empty band. And let's randomly take some of the silicon atoms and change them to phosphorus. I don't know, maybe one in a billion or one in a million we change to phosphorus. Phosphorus has one more electron than silicon does. And those electrons will form their own tiny little band in the gap. So the new band gap is much smaller than the overall old band gap was. That means that these uppermost electrons don't need nearly as much energy to get up into this empty band, this band where conductivity can happen. Um, you can significantly increase the amount of um, conductivity that you have in silicon by doping. Uh, you know, and it, the amount of doping basically uh, determines how much. Um, if you have one part per thousand, then you can get conductivity similar to actual metals. Usually it's like one part per billion or one part per million. And this actually leads to a nice point about um, solar energy. Uh, if you want solar energy, you need conductive silicon. So silicon that isn't quite as pure as what is used in the electronics industry is what you need to make solar cells. <laughs> One thing that can happen as well, uh, we could put um, aluminum atoms in. Aluminum has one less electron than silicon does. And so our band gap actually um, also decreases, but uh, the conductivity is due to the holes that are left in the lower band. Okay? So when you have more electrons and you have more negative charge, 
Uh, we call it p-doping when we have fewer electrons or positive charge. We call it p-doping. The beautiful things about n-doping and p-doping, for n-doping, the um, electrons are mobile in the upper band. For p-doping, the electrons are mobile in the lower band. So what happens when you put two materials together? One is n-doped, one is p-doped. Well, um, in the, the p-doped, the electrons travel at a lower energy. In the n-doped, they travel at a higher energy. So if you want the electrons to move, let's say, from right to left in this diagram, where the two substances come into contact, the electrons have to get energy from somewhere. And a convenient source might be a photon. So a photon could take an electron, give it enough energy, and have it hop up into this upper level. Okay? Uh, for, and essentially, that's uh, the basis of our uh, solar power, um, having electrons hop up from the low energy holes into the um, high energy um, conduction band, and then have the substance not just decide, oh, well, the electron's just going to roll back and I'm going to make heat. Um, having it easier for the high energy electrons to actually escape into a wire, do some work, and then um, come back to another wire into uh, the p-type p -type semiconductor. Uh, that's, that's the trick. So um, in our semiconductor in industry, uh, diodes, LEDs, they're all based on this uh, PN junction, where you've got these two types of materials um, uh, in contact with each other. A regular old diode, um, you simply apply a voltage. Maybe you have um, a voltage that will allow the current to want to go um, from left to right, i.e. the flow of electrons from left to right, all these electrons can then just tumble down into the lower energy uh, band and release some of that energy as heat. Right? For certain substances, as the electrons tumble down into the lower band, they can release a photon and then you have an LED. Okay? So these PN uh, junctions can serve as um, harvesters of energy or releasers of energy, depending on what you do with them. So um, I was a touch lazy. I actually uh, got some uh, figures from um, the American Chemical Society's um, um, service where they, you know, you actually look up a paper and then you can click on the op option, export this um, figure as a PowerPoint slide. So I did that. Um, and here's a, a mock-up of a, um, a solar cell. And in this particular one, we've got the perovskite um, instead of the silicon as the, um, as the magic ingredient. A photon would come in, excite an electron from the lower band into the upper band. And then we arrange matter so the electron can diffuse into uh, some other material and then go into a third material. FTO stands for fluorinated tin oxide. It happens to be transparent, so it's actually a great substance to make transparent electrodes out of there. We'll get to what's a perovskite in a, in a second. Um, the electron can move around circuit and then back into another uh, transparent electrode, um, which for some reason, it has carbon attached to it. I don't really know why you need a transparent electrode if you're just going to cover it with carbon. Um, and then uh, some other material um, that has a conduction band that matches the valence band of, it could be perovskite, but this could also work exactly the same for a um, silicon solar cell. Uh, nice point about, let's see, I got some annotation here. Uh, this guy matches the, the copper thiocyanate, C-U-S-E-N, matches the perovskite lower band. 
and it turns out it doesn't leach atoms into the perovskite to poison its function. The titanium dioxide has a band that matches the upper band and doesn't leach atoms to poison the perovskite. Um, these, are, these are issues of um, more engineering than of the actual chemistry. But if you want a solar cell to last for years, like 25 years on top of your house, you actually have to make it so that the um, slow diffusion of atoms doesn't screw things up. Oh, fluorinated tin oxide. FTO is simply a transparent electrode. Uh, that just blows my mind, because whenever um, I think of electrodes, I think of platinum, and I can't really see through platinum. Here we get to the, what perovskites are. The actual mineral perovskite is calcium titanium oxide, CaTiO3. But these days, um, anything that has a structure similar to um, the perovskite tidal mineral um, is called a perovskite. So basically, anything that's got an A with BX3, right? A point about each X is that each X connects two of the Bs. We form an extended lattice with roughly cube-shaped vacant spaces. Uh, let's see. Okay, so here's, here's another slide I got from the ACS from um, Journal of Physical Chemistry Letters. This one is more about teaching physical chemistry. This is an actual perovskite structure. So what we can see is that these Bs form a cube. And um, each B is connected to the next B by whatever atom X is. And A sits in the middle of the cube. Okay? I actually like the picture on the left more than the picture on the right. The picture on the right is uh, one of the types of models that we use to make um, to assemble 3D models in hands-on experiments in the lab. And, you know, I, I think Second Life does such a, a better job of allowing people to visualize something like this in a more hands-on way than even this physical model. All right, so I built the same thing up here somewhere. There it is. Let's bring it down. And down we come. And we'll do this. Okay, so this um, I built from um, crystal structure data collected in 1925. Um, I think on one of these panels behind you, if you click on it, you'll actually get a link to the um, original article, or at least the reference. Um, and essentially, um, the blue atoms represent titanium. The red atoms represent um, oxygen. So each titanium atom is in the center of an octahedron. Okay, So an octahedron actually has six vertices, um, basically at 1 and minus 1 on x, y, and z axes. Um, and these octahedra share vertices throughout the structure. The green basically represents uh, calcium. So it's a very cube-oriented type of structure. Um, it's actually very reminiscent. I'm going to raise that up again. Edit. Move you back up. Maybe not terribly high. Um, if you can uh, use your cameras to move around the structure to kind of see it in its full three-dimensional glory, that would be wonderful. It's very reminiscent of the Prussian blue structure. And I, I made a Prussian blue model for an earlier talk. Let's see. I don't want that to come in just the audience, so let's move it over here. So um, in the Prussian blue model, edit, come on down, click. It looks very much like a cage. Okay. 
And the Prussian blue model is, is a little bit different because um, each of the uh, vertices represents an iron atom, and each of the crossbars represents a C and an N, a cyanide. Um, but um, for the purpose of this talk, we basically have kind of a cubic structure, and it would be based on the AX3s. Um, and inside each of these cubes, there lives um, an A, whatever that is. And usually A has a positive charge, and BX3, whatever it is, ends up having a net negative charge. And when we put those units together, we get this cage. Prussian blue type of cat. Oh, um, it would have to be a blue cat, a bright blue cat. Edit. I'm going to move uh, Prussian blue out of the way. It is really blue. I mean, it was discovered like in the early 1700s. Uh, Michael Faraday played with it. Back up we go. It's magic. Yay. Okay. So essentially, I covered that one. Um, Things like Science News, Discover, um, other magazines have been covering uh, perovskites uh, recently. Perovskite's just a structural motif. It's like Paisley. Paisley is a pattern. Perovskite is a pattern. Uh, basically, how, um, how things are um, attached together. So many materials exist with this uh, pattern. As I said before, about a decade of progress. Um, has equaled where uh, we are in 50 years of silicon solar cell uh, development. Um, I usually look at uh, chemistry or chemical and engineering news um, from the American uh, Chemical Society. Uh, usually picks up uh, science stories a bit sooner than uh, science news or um, the other popular news magazines. Um, you know, perovskites being used as solar cells, to me that just blows my mind. It's like, you know, saying, oh, my VCR can control satellites now? I'm glad I didn't throw it out. Why perovskites? So, it's a great question. One major advantage they have over silicon is that uh, they're much easier to fabricate you don't need to get the purity nearly um, as um, you don't have to get the uh, purity to exactly the same um, standard that you do uh, for silicon. Uh, and the purification of silicon has a really high carbon footprint and uh, really uh, uses a lot of other toxic materials. Um, the perovskites that we use, yes, we're actually going to use lead. Um, however, the amount of um, lead we use is very small in them. And the um, um, overall process to fabricate the cells is so much easier uh, that it counterbalances, um, you know, what uh, the, the toxicity of the uh, process to actually get the silicon. And that's a great question. Which lasts longer if applied as a solar conductor? I'm going to address that. So um, in 2014, um, the, the uh, perovskites had gone from about 6, six to 8% efficiency up to uh, 16. Um, in December 2014, they were up at 20.1%. Uh, and the best silicon cells have about 25% efficiency. Okay, so basically here that's that's uh, news as of 2015. Here we have our uh, little picture of fluorine doped tin electron. That's the FTO, titanium oxide, the counter electrode. So this is a graph showing what the substances actually looked like at the time. Um, very very uh, small micrograph there. We gained some. Um, time. Yeah, these guys are air sensitive. Uh, the ones that have been using, uh, that have uh, been used are um, a uh, methyl ammonium lead iodide. It has the perovskite structure, but um, it really only lasted minutes. 
on exposure to air. This didn't sound very good at the beginning, but um, over the last few years, um, people have figured out what causes these to be uh, sensitive. So it turns out, you know, every one of those holes in the cage structure, if it's the um, PBI3 uh, stuff that we're using, um, if you have a random absence of an iodide in one of the cages, um, that is a place where oxygen can be turned into O2 minus, which is then just chews up the rest of the structure. So a simple fix is simply just to coat uh, the surface with sodium iodide or um, some maybe uh, methyl ammonium iodide, just to coat some iodide on the surface to uh, protect against that. So another um, advance was I mentioned methyl ammonium. I've got a picture of that in a second. Um, changing uh, the methyl ammonium to a mixture of um, this formamidinium, that's hard to pronounce, um, changing what is in the holes in the cage um, allows uh, for increasing, increases in um, efficiency and um, increases in stability. So this is, again, uh, from 2014, and this was where this approach was first found. As of early 2018, we're at 23% efficiency. It's in the process of being commercialized. Um, the best ones actually now equal um, the uh, silicon cells. And uh, the ones that were first investigated were these methyl ammonium. So we've got a carbon with three hydrogens. We've got a nitrogen with three hydrogens. The overall thing has a plus charge. That lives inside the cages. And that was replaced by this guy, formamidinium, but uh, really just replaced by a mixture of these organic guys, some rubidiums, and some cesiums. At this time, um, Oxford PV, it's a spinoff from uh, Oxford University, um, their test unit they demonstrated recently um, was uh, act actually this is the current issue of CNE News, so uh, that's this week. Um, the test unit was at 25.2 percent, very comparable to solar cells from silicon. Um, the uh, units that they've made off of their test assembly line, 243 square uh, centimeters. Um, they are at 24% um, efficiency, and we've now got them running for, quote, thousands of hours at 60 degrees Celsius. And they actually withstand minus 40 up to 85 degrees Celsius, and they even withstand 85% humidity at 85 degrees Celsius. So these coatings are actually, <laughs> yeah, these coatings are actually lasting uh, very well. Um, Aragon, this is a great point. Ironic that light is bad for solar power. Yeah, it is. Um, I've always wanted like the solar powered light bulb. Um, it always seems it always seems um, ironic to me. So this is commercially where we're at. The um, perovskites um, probably by 2020 there will be commercial um, manufacturers of these. Uh, uh, um, Oxford PV is looking to sell these commercially in 2020. Um, you know, until then and even past then, these actually have the potential to have even more improvements in their efficiency. Uh, and there's other things that we can do. There's there's no reason why you can't have a transparent electrode, a thin layer of perovskite sandwiched in between another transparent electrode to get the uh, short wavelengths of light. And then the longer wavelengths of light can penetrate through uh, to a regular silicon uh, bottom cell uh, to up the um, efficiency of these guys. Um, even um, have a um, design like this one where uh, the electrodes aren't really separated by a gap. Okay, so. You know, one of the nice things about the perovskites is that they can simply be made uh, quite easily. Um, 
they also serve as LED materials, which are wonderful. Uh, and that's, you know, you basically have to apply uh, voltage to force the electrons to move. And uh, there, if you're lucky, you can get um, the electrons to jump down into the conduction band from the other conduction band, as I, as I talked about earlier. So, um, well, no, no talk from me would be complete without a few of these magic eye things. I've got some wall-eyed stereograms. I've got some uh, rotating GIFs. Okay, if we can just bring these back forward. Okay, um, let's see. Edit. Okay, if I can bring them all up and over as a unit. There we go. Um, I'll leave these are out. Um, I'll leave these out so you can see them. Um, maybe I'll move these other things out of the way. Oop. Oop. There we go. Yeah, if you click on if you click on any one of those panels, um, it should start and show you a rotating 3D GIF. the The panels themselves um, have the let's see the diamond structures on the left and perovskites at various magnifications are on the right. They're the cross-eyed stereograms. Um, some people can actually see these if you just cross your eyes and make the images overlap and then just watch. I have to be careful because I can get mesmerized by these things. Awesome. OK. So I've shown you a few of those. Um, I will uh, put this, um, I will put this uh, presenter up somewhere in the Mike Chem Lab. And uh, um, I think group members will be able to click through it. Let's see. I just had a few more slides about how do people approach this research? Well, you know, people uh, approach it synthetically by uh, making compounds. Um, yeah, uh, Arizona and Australia, um, we might have to worry about the heat. I'm not sure if it gets above 85 degrees Celsius in either of those areas. Um, although it, it could, I suppose, um, as these things um, absorb absorb energy. Um, so yeah, a couple of slides. This is uh, from a typical paper from uh, recent work where they made uh, the tin iodide. The tin is a little less toxic than the lead, and it does some of the same chemistry. Here you can see they have a, a different uh, cation. This cation, this thing on the left, would sit within um, the holes, the cubic holes in the cages. Um, and they made a couple of flavors of these things. Um, the second one I'm showing you here is fluorinated. And uh, they have a perovskite structure that's a little bit distorted. This distorted structure actually slows down the movement of electrons a little bit better, which actually is a beneficial thing um, and uh, prevents um, energy wasting recombination of electrons and holes. So um, there's and the, the minor change, just replacing a hydrogen by a fluorine, doesn't really change the structure uh, very much. It kind of makes it a touch more compact. Um, but, and you kind of see there's a gratuitous cat sketch. There's um, addressing a um, concern about the number of cats in my um, talk earlier. Um, and you can kind of see that it's not perfectly cubic anymore. Okay, so the size of the cations that live in um, these cubic holes actually does play a role in um, just kind of changing the shape a little bit of those holes. And again, that's uh, showing you how these um, species can pack. Plus, uh, plus another random cat, I guess. Um, and uh, just at the end, I uh, talked a little bit about a recent Roald Hoffman paper I saw. Uh, Roald Hoffman, a very interesting 
um, fellow. He's a 1981 Nobel laureate in uh, chemistry. He's known for the theoretical chemistry. Any of you who took organic chemistry may have heard of the uh, Woodward Hoffman rules. He's the Hoffman of Woodward Hoffman um, that uh, uh, explained things like the Diels-Alder reaction that you would have seen in second year organic chemistry. Um, Nobel, uh, Nobel laureate, um, also a playwright and a poet. There's a lovely, um, there's a lovely summary of his work on on the wiki page, which I can, if I'm lucky. If I'm lucky, why am I not seeing this? Here we are. Um, I can cut and paste into text for you. <laughs> Yeah, I hate people. I hate people who who can do uh, so many good things. Um, anyway, <laughs> um, so you know, he talked about the theory of these, the theoretical aspect. Here's here's a typical um, typical perovskite structure again. Um, you know, maybe some of, one of these pictures actually shows um, how it's put together um, better than better than others. Um, and you know he was kind of looking at cesium lead bromide as one of the one of the best in this paper and i gotta tell you the theory stuff ends up being way um beyond me any aspects um he defined several um arrangements of how the lead and the bromide talk to each other and they're very um they're very subtly different like, you look at this guy right here and it's got a uh, light color on the left dark color on the right the whole picture duplicated except this one is dark on the right I'm sorry dark on the left and light on the right and this basically shows different ways of combining um, orbitals to get um, to get the, the structure um, and you can do all sorts of calculations to figure out what the band gaps are going to be as you morph from one structure into another. And then putting all of these together actually gives you some idea of what the band gaps are going to be. Interestingly, you have to take into account relativistic effects. Um, when uh, you have um, the electrons on lead, like the S-type electrons on lead, when they fall down into that potential energy well toward the nucleus, they're accelerated to relativistic speeds. And that affects the mass of the electron. And so that mass change actually does uh, matter in terms of these calculations. Okay? So in fact, um, you know, if you're looking at just gold itself, you need the relativistic effects to be able to explain the yellow color of gold. Um, am I referring to hybrid orbitals? Yes, yes I was. So um, the, uh, you know, the details of all of this are, are way beyond um, this talk, but um, um, you know, we are actually looking at the theory of why we get certain band gaps. And one of the nice things about uh, the perovskites is that the band gap is controllable over a wider range than what we can get for silicon. Um, and how might you prepare one of these solar cells? Um, if you have your electrodes, uh, titanium dioxide, and the various materials, you're going to sandwich them together with binder clips, at least in the lab, for being able to teach people um, how these things work. Um, and in fact, uh, this uh, Journal of Physical Chemistry Letters uh, paper has a nice procedure for taking the fluorinated tin oxide glass, applying a tin oxide, a titanium oxide layer, sorry. Titanium oxide occurs naturally in white paint um, to make it white. Um, you can apply a perovskite layer, a copper uh, thiocyanate layer, a carbon layer, and then another uh, glass layer. And that ends up uh, giving you a um, solar cell that lasts long enough for the um, experiment to take place, um, you know, because the early ones would just like catch fire on exposure to air. Uh, and, you know, in this 
kind of homemade lab electrode uh, setup. Um, in the dark, you can see zero volts with some light shining. Um, there is a voltage. Um, yay! Yes, eventually recycling these materials is going to be uh, hazardous. Probably not much more hazardous than the uh, silicon type materials um, with um, the uh, various solder and various um, other components that are around. Um, I did see a um, I did see an article where the recycling, um, for example, if you use the lead, um, the recycling was about um, issues with you'd have to worry about the lead uh, toxicity. It would be about point two seven percent of the overall um, toxicity of the uh, process for um, making and using uh, these things. Um, and I think that was relative to the silicon solar cells. So yeah, um, anything we use is going to have a downside. Uh, my last little uh, story. There's some um, lovely things, uh, lovely paper here from 2016 that says, hey, purity matters. So they used um, pure perovskites instead of just slop that was put uh, together in situ. And you can kind of see the film they made with uh, the beautiful polarized uh, pictures. And again, they have the indium tin oxide glass. Um, I don't know what pedot is. I'm assuming it's something like the copper cyanide or copper thiocyanate perovskite, and um, this is a, a buckyball uh, composite um, as the collector. And uh, you know, basically, they took various compounds. You can see crystalline. They take their crystalline pure material, dissolve them up and cast them and make films out of them. And essentially, you can see the um, single crystal powders have some nice x-ray bands, nice and sharp. After you make a thin plate of them, still um, nice sharp bands. Some of the weaker um, um, intensity bands aren't seen anymore. That might just be a thickness issue. Uh, and then, uh, let's see, these bottom pictures are basically um, absorbance versus uh, wavelength. So it's kind of showing you which wavelengths these things will absorb. Um, see the black one seems to be, I think it's the iodide one, seems to be the one that gets most of the visible light. Um, how do these things compare with what people are usually doing? So on the left, it's the data for the um, Pure materials. It's on the right. It's uh, comparable data for stuff that's just slopped together and uh, cast in situ. You can see the difference in just the photographs in the top row. Um, pure materials give you lovely crystalline um, patterns. Um, the impure materials just give you slop, and the slop uh, doesn't last nearly as long. This bottom row, number F shows degradation over just a few days, whereas um, E, pure materials, uh, give you less degradation. Uh, any interesting work being done with graphene in solar power? Um, not that I'm aware. It's, it's very conductive. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm not an expert in the field. Um, graphene is a great conductor. And along certain directions, yes. So, okay, so here, a uh, good time to conclude. I think my time is, oh, I'm over my time. I always do this, I'm sorry. Um, we have new tricks from a common structure, and uh, we've come a long way in the last decade, and there's probably a lot more progress that can be made, uh, particularly to uh, stability, efficiency, and you never know. We may find a uh, perovskite structure that's based on totally non-toxic material because uh, it's the structure. It's like paisley. I mean, you can have paisley made from um, you know, you know the the um, any different um, color combinations, um, floral power. There's there's just uh, 
a lot of room in the periodic table to be able to explore um, this particular structure. So here we are, uh, some more resources. I use JMOL, I use the crystal structure repositories, I use Blender to make my things. Um, I drew my cat, um, I drew a cat. Um, and thanks to all my cats for their, um, for their patience. Um, let's see, uh, and obviously thanks to the members and students of the Science Circle. Um, I always enjoy giving these talks. Uh, thanks to my colleagues, um, um, place where I work because um, this activity is recognized. Um, NSF for funding, I always um, thank uh, NSF and uh, you know this uh, little company for hosting some of my animated GIFs and stuff on their website. So that's what I got for you. Oh, we'll we'll talk about desensitized solar cells sometime later. Yay. All righty. Tagline, I agree. Um, rare earth elements uh, for making uh, semiconductors, uh, that is a problem. They're not easily uh, found in con concentrations worth mining. Awesome. Awesome. I will copy that browser. Let's see. I will copy that and open that and watch that later. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know much about thermal type panels. Cool. Well, I'm going to have some coffee. Let's see, Physics Today article. Oh, very cool. Awesome. I'm going to get some coffee and uh, hang out for um, some of the for for uh, the talk with Chantal um, in about ten minutes. All right, going off.